Hello everyone, welcome to OO Considered Harmful. I'm Phil Nash and I'm going to spend the next 60 minutes or so talking about all the ways that OO uh, could be harmful to us or maybe not, we'll, we'll see, see how that goes. Um, we're actually going to spend most of that time just getting all of our ducks in a row, which is not really what this background image is for. You can think of it maybe as more like a, a proxy for duck typing, which we're probably not going to talk about much either. Anyway, getting ahead of myself, I actually want to get back to that title. So, OO considered harmful. Sounds familiar. We might consider that a bit of a meme these days, the, you know, something considered harmful. Uh, actually, you know, before we thought of these things as memes, they, uh, they, they still existed. In fact, they have their own name. Uh, snow clones is when you have some sort of template phrase used as a title for a, a talk or an article or, or something like that. Uh, been around for a long time. This particular one, it's actually probably been around for longer than, than you think. Uh, so before we started using a software development in the 60s, which I'll talk about in a moment, it's actually used at least as early as the 40s in uh, journalism circles. So actually, you know, only really crossed over into software development in, in the 60s. And it, it did that in the article that you're thinking of, which is, of course, go to, considered harmful. I only had to put two letters in there. That's, that's quite nice. Actually, Technically, that's not true. It's a go-to statement considered harmful is the, the full title of the article, which wasn't even an article, it was a letter to a magazine from uh, Edgar Dijkstra, of course, in 1968. He wrote to the, uh, the communications of the ACM magazine. And in yet another historical inaccuracy, that wasn't even the title that he submitted it under. He originally called it a case against the go-to statement. And it was the editor, Nicholas Wirth, that changed it to go to statement considered harmful uh, because of that snow clone that was uh, popular in, in journalism circles at the time. And to give it a bit more impact, these days we might say, you know, clickbait didn't have clicks back in those days, but, uh, you know, still having a title that, that had some impact to drawing readers, well, it you know, certainly had that effect. We remember it today. In fact, I'm pretty sure that most people watching this are familiar with this title. Has everybody read it? Well, I'm going to get you to tell me. So if you are watching this live, I am pasting a link into the uh, Remo chat now, if that's going to work for me. There we go. That should be there. Now, it will take a few seconds for that to get to you because of the delay going around to, uh, to YouTube. So I'm just going to waffle a little bit while that happens. Uh, but this is just uh, some interactive um, slides that I, I've got here, which I'm just going to initiate now. Okay, so that should give you time to, to actually get the page. So you can tell me if you have read that paper or not. Um, so I'm going to ask, oh, in fact, yeah, Jens is already ahead of me and he's put that up for me. Thank you. We're getting some results in. So I can see that as expected, most people have not read it, which is fine. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, before I did this talk or started preparing for it, I'm not sure if I'd read it in full. So it's a shame, really, because it's actually a really good uh, paper. So it's a letter to a magazine. We consider it an article now. There's some good stuff in there. It's not just limited to the go-to statement. So, yeah, six people say they've read it fully. And I'm sure some of those are exaggerating. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to, if, if you can take me back to the slides, Jens. Thank you. Because I have it here. Well, this is half of it. So the full thing is only about uh, twice as long as, as you see on screen now. You can read it in, in one sitting. I definitely recommend it, but I just want to pull out a quote. So he starts to build up his initial argument. I just want to go to his second remark, where he says, my second remark is that our intellectual powers are rather geared to master static relations, and that our powers to visualize processes evolving in time are relatively poorly developed. Interesting wording there. And it's really bringing in the human element to this. It's our powers of visualization that are relatively, relatively poorly developed. And actually it goes on. For that reason, we should do, as wise programmers aware of our limitations, our utmost to shorten the conceptual gap between the static program and the dynamic process. To make the correspondence between the program spread out in text space and the process 
spread out in time, as trivial as possible. Now, I think that's where it gets really interesting, talking about this conceptual gap between the code that we write and try to understand, and the relationships there, statically, and the actual dynamic process at runtime and how that unfolds, because they're not going to be the same thing. But we want to do as much as we can to, to make them the same way they can be, because that's going to make it much easier for us to understand, follow, and reason about it. And really, that's what this whole article is about. It's about being able to reason about your code. And then, of course, he goes on to make the case for why uh, GoTo gets in the way of that, makes it almost impossible to reason about lines of code in isolation, what we now might call local reasoning, because you can have needed multiple entry points, just completely screws up your ability to reason about it without having to consider all of the code. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because it's not just when it comes to GoTo and uh, execution through code that this principle comes up. We're going to come back to this a bit later. So I do encourage you to read the whole thing at some point. Um, mostly it's pretty accessible. There's just a bit in there about text indexes that may not be immediately obvious, but it's really just talking about how we, we think about the execution uh, pointer moving through the code and how we can reason about it. But, you know, this is all old stuff now, isn't it? You know, he's talking about this in the concept of uh, what became structured programming, which we've now sort of absorbed into uh, mainstream practices, particularly OO. So, yeah, we don't need to go back to this, do we? Well, I think Kevin Henney might disagree with you. Uh, he seems to think that we have forgotten much of the art of structured programming and that there's still valuable stuff back then in the, in the 60s when we were first talking about it that maybe we're, we're missing at least some of the nuances now that we could go back and look at some of the historical context, but also you know, some of these things are timeless. Some of these things will still help us to reason about our code uh, and maybe we just don't really talk about it so much now. So. It's a great talk that he did last year, C++ on C, The Forgotten Art of Structured Programming. Maybe you've even seen it. It's a good chance you have, because last time I checked, uh, about an hour ago, actually, on YouTube, had 160,000 views. Now, if you've ever looked at view counts of C++ talks, you'll know that's, that's pretty good. There's only a few that get up that high, most of them by Biana. So this is a bit of an outlier. I don't know exactly what's going on there, but it's clearly a popular talk. And that's good, because it's a great talk. Kevin's talks are always really insightful. And in fact, I have a bit of a confession to make here. When I was first preparing for, for this talk, uh, well, I, I knew going in that I was going to be referring to, you know, one or two of Kevin's talks. Because thinking back, I could trace back my thinking on certain things to something that I'd heard Kevin say. But the more, the more I looked into it, the more I realised that no matter where I looked, it seemed like Kevin got there before me. It's a bit like that South Park episode, where no matter what they did, they realised that the Simpsons had already done it. Except in this case, it was Kevin and Henny that had already done it. But you know what? That's a good thing, because this talk is going to be quite high level, fairly sort of philosophical. We'll look at some of the nuts and bolts, but mostly we're just going to be looking at the broad strokes. We're not going to go very deep on, on most things, but we're going to talk about a lot of different subjects. So the fact that I can point to you to a number of talks by Kevin and Henny, it's a good thing. You can go and uh, fill up on, on those. In fact, there's a few other talks and, and books and articles and references that I'm going to link to a page containing at the end of this talk. So don't worry about keeping track now. I'll give you that link at the end. Uh, let's carry on though, because so far we are what, uh, 10 minutes into the talk and I haven't actually talked about OO yet. So let's get there. What is OO? Well, again, before we, we talk too much about this, uh, I want to, well, I should start off by saying, of course, as we know, OO stands for object orientation, but what is that? And this is where I want to go to my next interactive slide. I've just uh, advanced that on. So go back to that link if you've left it, otherwise it will take you there. You can actually put in words or maybe short phrases that you think are associated with object orientation either define it or at least associated with it. What do you think object orientation really is? And again, it's going to be 10 seconds or so before they start to come up. I can see some coming up now. Messages, that's an interesting first one to come up. Classes is probably more commonly the first thing people will think of. Inheritance, reusable, 
Yep. Now we're getting. Now we're getting there. Adam K. That's interesting. Small talk. That's some some good suggestions there. So I, I did this at uh, CPPCon as well. Uh, I have to say, obviously the the big ones are about the same, but lots of the little ones are very different. I have to combine these all at some point. So if you're seeing that, you can see that there's a lot of different things that people associate with object orientation, but the big ones standing out there quite clearly, inheritance, encapsulation, polymorphism. I think most people agree they are sort of the bedrock of OO. But if you could uh, take me back to my slides, please, Jens. Thank you. Where did it all start? What was the uh, the, the initial motivation for object orientation. So I think most people would point back to Simula as being the, the first, uh, what we might call, object-oriented language. Certainly some of the ideas may have come before that, uh, particularly um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of things around abstract data types will sound very familiar when you, when you talk about it in object-oriented ways, but Simula was the first language that we think of as being object-oriented. Again, you know, like that uh, Dijkstra article. Most people know that, but they don't know much beyond that. Uh, that's, that was true of me. So I wanted to look into the history of it a bit. It's quite interesting. Uh, first, there are, there are two main branches of the language. They're almost like two different languages. The original Simula one, which uh, came out in um, 1965, uh, certainly the early 60s. Um, and then there was uh, the follow-up language, Simula 67, obviously came out in 1967. The reason that's interesting is because, as I say, they're very different languages, and particularly their take on what we now call object orientation. It's actually quite different. So, Simula 1, the, the idea of an object is based around what came to be called a process. So that's interesting straight away, because we think of processes as very dynamic things. Um, and these processes have basically three operations. Uh, that the main run, which is the, the the main entry point to to a function, and then you can have suspend and resume. And again, this may sound familiar because this is basically what we would now think of as a coroutine. In fact, coroutines were were around in the sixties as well. Another old idea that's coming back. This is what Simula 1 had as objects. Objects were processes. They were effectively coroutines. So how does that make them objects? Well, if you think of a coroutine, in fact, there's, there's a really good talk by uh, uh, Rainer Grimm that I think is going to be giving tomorrow about the evolution uh, um, in a C++ context from uh, basic functions to overloaded functions to uh, lambdas uh, via function objects and eventually to coroutines and how each one is the generalization of the previous one. So coroutines are basically functions with state, which is what lambdas are, but they also have this ability to be suspended and resumed. Now processes back in Simula 1 were a bit more basic. Um, you couldn't run them concurrently for a start, so you, we suspended one process in order to uh, start or resume another one. Uh, but that, that's all fine. But because they had their own state, that state was effectively encapsulated in the process. So process had state and had a runtime execution. And it had a form of encapsulation because outside of that process, you couldn't access the state within the, the, the process or coroutine, very much like coroutines now. Although now you can... Um, Give it access, of course. So then they came to do Simula 67. Now, Simula 1 was much more of a research project, or at least it was um, It was really geared up to simulations, hence the name. But it was so successful, they realized that they really needed to make it much more general and mainstream. And so they took this idea of a process and they generalized that further to what they called a class. And now it's sounding more familiar again. Interesting that the class was the generalization of 
effectively the co-routine. Not something, not a way around that we're used to, used to thinking of them. But they had all the familiar features. You could have subclasses. You could have uh, variables, which we might call member variables now, or fields. Procedures, or member functions, or methods. And virtuals, things that you could override in a subclass in a derived class, or the other way around. So it had polymorphism. Interestingly, one thing it didn't have, at least in the Simula 67 variant, was encapsulation. Now, when I made this statement in my CPPCon version, in the, the YouTube comments, somebody said, actually, Simula 67 did have encapsulation, had this uh, hidden protected keyword. Um, and I, I was looking into it, and I cannot find any mention of hidden protected for Simula before, uh, I think, Simula 85. Uh, and some branches before that, but Simulus 7, as far as I can tell, did not have encapsulation in the form that we know it today, other than what it inherited, if you pardon the pun, from Simula 1 in the form of these processes, which it still had. The process was now a particular type of class. And in fact, it's really downplayed, uh, the process part of Simulus 67. It's all about the classes. I think it's a bit of a shame because that idea sort of faded out for a while in mainstream circles and has only recently become very popular again. So, okay, so we have classes, we have inheritance, we have polymorphism, uh, we don't quite have encapsulation, but definitely recognizable object-oriented features in Simula 67. And of course we have developed that further in, in languages since then, as we'll see in a moment. Let's have a look at a bit of code. Now, I've never written a line of Simula, in, in any form. So I just got this example um, off the internet somewhere, so I can't vouch for it too much, but it looks fairly understandable. So we have a dog class, uh, has a, a, a virtual bark procedure, and then a, a derived class. So I like the way that derived classes put the, the base class name before the class keyword. So we say it's a dog class, Chihuahua, and then that overrides the, uh, the, the bark procedure there. Um, syntax may be slightly different to what we're familiar with, but I think it's all readily understandable and very familiar. Well, we can easily see how that works if we've used any modern OO language. So, yeah, interesting. Right back then, it's already looking very, very familiar. So I mentioned more recent languages. Actually, going back before Simula, we had Algol. Simula was actually a... Uh, Initially, a strict superset of Algol. In fact, Simula 1 was originally just going to be a, a post-processing step, much like the original C++ uh, CBU classes was a, um, a front-end for, for C. Uh, Simula was with Algol. So it's very much uh, tied to the Algol syntax. But Algol actually gave birth to a number of other languages in the, the non-OO branch, from uh, CPL through BCPL and B, to C, those other languages don't really get much of a mention these days other than as predecessors of C, but that, that's where that language sort of baked and, uh, and led to C. And I think it was actually B, or no, BCPL, that uh, Bjarne was using at university when he first got the ideas for, for doing C++. So those two branches effectively converged when, uh, when Bjarne created C++. Now, obviously, this is a simplified view. There's lots of other players, but I think it's fair to say these are the, the essential um, fundamental influences of C++. We have the uh, most of the Algol syntax via the C branch, and then we have the OO features uh, heavily derived from, from Simula. And I, I think we've seen that in, in what we looked at. But there were other derivations of similar or, or rather branches in the family tree. Uh, small talk went off in a different direction, as did Eiffel. Now I've put those two up there because they, they have some very strong ideas about OO that are a bit different to C++, and we're going to look at those in a minute. Small talk's particularly interesting because back in the early 80s, when C++ was getting off the ground, there was actually a lot of interest in languages that looked like C, or extended C, with OO features. 
Obviously, C++ was the one that survives to today. But also, Objective-C came out of that same um, melting pot of ideas and still survives to this day, although it's obviously fading a little bit in lieu of, um, of Swift. But that comes from the small talk line. And in fact, it's, uh, a, well, it's a strict superset of C with small talk features grafted on the top. And it almost, uh, I think it originally was, basically uh, macros on top, much like C++ was. And that's, that's got some interesting consequences that we'll see in a moment. So what I want to do is just stack up these, these languages for these. I'll group them to four, there's five languages there. Let's put Smalltalk and Objective-C together, because I think for our purposes here, they're essentially the same. And just look at some of the OO features that they all have. So first of all, they all have in common classes, inheritance in some form, and polymorphism in some form. Devil's in the details, and we're going to get to that. So one of the details is that inheritance comes as single or multiple inheritance. Similar, strictly sing single inheritance. Uh, small talk and Objective-C are single inheritance for implementation, but Objective-C does have multiple inheritance for protocols, what we might call interfaces, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, C++, of course, has multiple inheritance, as does Eiffel. Eiffel is often considered to have a much superior multiple inheritance to C++. A lot of the issues that we, we tend to see in C++ multiple inheritance uh, give it a bad name and people say, no, don't use multiple inheritance. It has all these problems. But it turns out they're mostly just C++ problems. Uh, Eiffel doesn't have those problems to, to a large extent. There may still be reasons to, to avoid it. There's also good reasons to, to have it in language. Eiffel does a much better job of it. Um, although I've never actually written any Eiffel either, I'm just relaying what I've read. So multiple inheritance there. All right, encapsulation. So I said that similar, other than similar one in that limited form, and as I've since found out, um, similar, I think it's 85, certainly later versions. Um, but similar 67 didn't have encapsulation as we know it. All the rest do. Interesting because it's often considered to be one of the, the, the more important features of OO encapsulation, but similarly didn't have it. Another idea that is considered by many people to be a really important point, part of OO, C++ doesn't have. And that's this idea that even classes are objects. If we're going to be object oriented, then classes should be objects too. And that actually has some consequences in, in those languages, as we're going to see uh, in a moment as well. In fact, one of the consequences is that they, their polymorphism is primarily implemented in terms of message passing. Let's have a look at what that actually means in practice, because you may have heard of message passing. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with how it actually works. So let's, let's talk about that. Let's start by just reviewing virtual dispatch in C++ as we know it today. In fact, it's just static dispatch to start with. If you have a, an object you want to call a method on it, then you, you call a function and you, the compiler will pass this hidden this pointer along with it. And that's accessible with inside, inside the method, but that's transparent to you. Fairly simple, straightforward, and fairly uh, performant. That's static dispatch. But when you introduce virtual dispatch, there's an extra step, of course. So we now have to consult a V table. So a table of pointers to virtual functions. So you'll have one for each static, um, sorry, dynamic instance of the object. So that gets looked up first. That gives you an extra indirection back to the method. So you have an extra lookup and an extra indirection. So there's obviously overhead there. You know, we're, we're familiar with that. Sometimes we forget about it, but it's always there. But what about message passing then? Start with the same idea that we want to we want to call the method, method one in this case, on an object. What, what actually happens here 
in certainly in small talk and Objective C is the object passes a message to the object that the message basically says I want to invoke method one optionally with these arguments but that's considered a message it goes to the object rather than uh, straight to the method so the object then looks up what it wants to do with that message by default that's typically just going to be to call a function with the same name a method so it looks like it's working the same way but because it's going via the object rather than um, a v table and a, and a this pointer or there is a, a self pointer as well that means that the object gets a look in and that means it doesn't have to do things that way in fact the object can um, it can respond to messages it doesn't have methods for it can uh, replace methods at runtime with different methods and it can even swap out whole implementations of whole objects at runtime depending on its own its own state let's just summarize some of those differences so message passing it's dynamic binding it's very late because the object gets a chance to decide what's where that's going to be routed to on every call um, it has this property of method swizzling that's where you can actually change which method actually gets called so in uh, javascript and ruby i think it's called uh, monkey patching same idea um, and you can have these runtime delegation patterns so it, like, even on construction a good example in objective c is if you construct a string object the the initializer what we might think of as a constructor for for the string will look at the string itself and depending on properties of it like its length and whether it in, includes unicode characters it will choose a different implementation for the string at runtime that will then look exactly the same to you from the outside just as a different implementation so it's like a factory method built in to the language uh, because you can change those methods at runtime it becomes very easy to mock it's a perfect fit for a message passing language so these are all, all nice properties whereas virtual dispatch it may be more efficient in fact for years i think we've convinced ourselves that yeah we we're giving up on all of those benefits that message passing has because vtable lookup it's an overhead but it's much more efficient you don't have to do these lookups which are usually string based and look up in a hash table but actually in practice in the the decades since um, certainly objective c got off the ground that message passing that there's a single uh, function in objective c called ob, ob c send message which is re responsible for this it's been so heavily optimized that certainly at one point about 10 years or so ago everyone was saying that uh, message passing in objective c is about the same as virtual dispatch in c plus plus and obviously that depends on a lot of factors it depends on what point of time you're talking about because compilers change cpus change the effect of caches and um, the locality and all these things change it's difficult to put your finger down and say yes this is definitely more efficient but certainly at times virtual dispatch has been more efficient that's probably why it was chosen originally in so many languages but really i mean we're not getting many other benefits maybe stronger type checking again to bring an objective c it's technically a dynamic language but it does do static type checking as well just gives you warnings instead of hard compiler errors and you can work around them but you should get most of the benefits of static type checking as well as the benefits of dynamic binding it's quite nice and apparently for very little overhead so all right virtual dispatch um, may not be the best way to implement polymorphism certainly not the only way neither is message passing there's actually uh, there's a whole family of approaches to polymorphism type erasure is another one that's getting quite popular um, in c circles and it doesn't have first class language support but you can do it with libraries uh, so dino is, is one that's been around for a few years uh, dynamic dynamix is another one uh, and i know uh, eduardo madrid is is working on uh, his own implementation which uh, he makes some quite big claims about particularly in terms of performance 
Uh, so that's going to be one to watch. Um, and and there are others. And of course, it crops up in, in all sorts of areas, like uh, std function has a form of a type erasure in it, um, std any. Uh, it's a very powerful technique, can be very performant, very flexible. Um, but as I say, no, no first class language support yet. So you have to do a bit more work. But some of the other benefits are non-intrusive. And what I mean by that is with virtual dispatch and inheritance, you bake into the type system that you want these objects to be treated polymorphically. Whereas they don't actually have to be properties of those types at all. Message passing doesn't have that problem, neither does type erasure. You can define your objects as is best for those objects, and then you can get them to respond in uniform ways via other means. And type erasure is one way to do that. Um, so they, they can be higher performance, and particularly if they are tuned to today's compilers and CPUs, they can actually have more optimization opportunities, actually show more of your intention to the compiler to to give it more to work with. And I think my favorite feature is they are much more compatible with, with value types. We'll talk about a little, that a little bit more in a moment. Um, I just want to finish the list here. Uh, concept mapping is another feature that uh, type erasure can give you that uh, we can't really get through um, virtual dispatch. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail about what that is, other than to say that it's a way of um, adapting interfaces. So, as I say, because you're not baking the polymorphism into the types themselves, the types interfaces may look a bit different, even if they work more or less the same way. So with, with concept mapping, you can actually uh, bridge those differences and give you a, a consistent way of calling something. And you can see why that would be necessary. If you have looked at um, Swift, Swift has something called uh, protocols, which it got from Objective-C. In Objective-C, protocols are really just interfaces. In Swift, they've been taken further, and they actually give you a chance at the interface level to add this extra code in that gives you this effectively concept mapping. Um, and you can actually add uh, protocols two types after the type definition itself. So you can say, I've got this class here. Later, I want, it, I want it to be able to conform to this protocol. And these methods are going to be implemented this way. It's a really powerful uh, approach to object orientation, which again, is much less intrusive on the, uh, the types themselves. So I don't know exactly how that's implemented under the hood. So I'm not going to claim it's the same as type erasure. Uh, I suspect there's some of that going on as well. Um, and uh, Clojure actually has uh, the same um, named feature, uh, protocols, which are mostly the same, but I think they have arrived at that independently. I think it's mostly a coincidence that they are uh, effectively the same. All right, I said there's other ways to do polymorphism. Another one that's becoming popular in C++ is what we call SAM types. At least that's the, the computer science -y name for them. Uh, we, we might think of it as things like std variant, uh, std optional. Uh, so anything, any type which can hold um, multiple other uh, objects of multiple other types internally. So obviously an optional, it's a type or nothing. Invariant, it could be one of um, any number of types. And, and, you know, we see other forms of this creeping up as well. But then you have to have ways to... Um, deal with those objects. Um, that that the concept mapping idea, if you like. Because we don't have uh, virtual methods, how can we call something on an object in a variant in a uniform way? Well, we have std visit in the language, which works. And I think that's about as much as we can say for it. Maybe it's, it's a bit less code than writing it out by hand. Um, there's there's an article that uh, many of you will have read. Uh, again, it's in the references, a couple of years old now. Um, the stood visit is everything that's wrong with C++. <laughs> I don't agree with everything in the article, but I think the central point stands that if 
Stood visit is the best way that we have in the language to deal with some types. Then we've got a long way to go before some types are a, a really first class way of doing polymorphism in C++. I'll go further and say that actually we need variant itself in the language as well, which is on the table. That's been proposed um, quite some time ago now, but it's been paused for a few years. Hopefully it'll come back on the table. What is going through a bit more faster pace is the pattern matching side of it. So this is what would effectively replace std visit. Um, does a lot more than std visit and it's much cleaner. Um, hopefully still targeting C23. That was never guaranteed. I think it slowed down even more in current uh, conditions of the, uh, the working group. But we're certainly working on it. And this will give you the ability to effectively do type switches. It's actually much more than that, but Imagine you could, in a, a switch statement, you could say a switch on the type of the variant, and in each case, you could, you could not only pull out that particular type, but you could even break down the um, uh, what's in, inside the variant uh, to, to greater levels. For example, if the variant held uh, another variant or a, or a structure or something else, you could actually pull out parts of that as well and maybe even match on values in there. So you could have a different case for when an optional is empty or, or non empty. So if you've not looked at pattern matching before, I definitely recommend you look into that. It's a really powerful language technique that is in many languages now, including Swift we've mentioned, uh, Rust is another um, popular one, most functional languages, and C++ is hopefully gonna get it in the next few years. So do watch that. That will really make some types a really powerful way of doing polymorphism in C++. Now, the main difference between uh, some types and the other forms of polymorphism are that they are um, uh, a bounded set of types. So with polymorphism, uh, so with um, inheritance and virtual dispatch, uh, it's very much an open set. Any class can implement a, um, a non-final base class. Whereas with some types, you have to specify the full set up front, much like you would in an enum. Now, most of the time, that is actually what you want. So it's a shame that we have this mismatch of an overly uh, flexible form of polymorphism for dealing with a much narrower uh, set of, of problems. Sometimes you do need the open set and it's useful to have more than one way of doing polymorphism. As I say, there are uh, a number of types. We're looking at a few here. Um, closure, again, has a concept called polymorphism a la carte. So actually uh, a feature of the language, if you like, is that it has multiple ways of doing polymorphism so that it covers all bases. You just pick the one that's right for the moment. All first class supported. Hopefully we'll get there in C++. I mentioned also a language level variant. Hopefully will be coming at some point as well because I think variant is, uh, is a bit heavy handed for, for a lot of, lot of use cases. So that's some types. Even um, templates, or these days concepts, can be used as a, a form of polymorphism at compile time. But nonetheless, um, much more um, flexible actually than uh, virtual dispatch, in a way more like message passing or perhaps type erasure. Quite interesting that we had that in the language, uh, well, from the beginning, really, but only at compile time. Now, what else? Well, is there actually any, um, any other need for implementation inheritance other than to support virtual dispatch? It's an interesting question. I'm sure you can think of some uh, niche uses, but generally implementation inheritance is only there to support virtual dispatch. So given that we have all these different ways of doing polymorphism, do we actually need in implementation inheritance at all? Interesting question. We'll come back to that. But let's talk about encapsulation. So we mentioned polymorphism, implementation, uh, Inherit implementation inheritance. What about encapsulation? 
So remember that we said that all of those um, OO languages that have a part to play in the history of C++, they will have some form of encapsulation, except for Simula 67, other than that limited form in the form of a process. So clearly that's important. Well, actually, I want to go back to Dijkstra's letter and that remark that we quoted. I'm going to read it again. Now think of this in terms of encapsulation. So my second remark is our intellectual powers are rather geared to master static relations and our powers to visualize processes evolving in time relatively poorly developed. It's interesting when you think of similar ones processes. For that reason, we should do our utmost to shorten the conceptual gap between the static program and the dynamic process to make the correspondence between the program spread out in text space and the process spread out in time as trivial as possible. So he was talking about go to's there. But as I said, when we looked at this the first time, this generalizes this can refer to lots of different things. And certainly for me, I don't know if you have the same reaction. The first thing I thought of when I read this was mutability. Mutability gives us a conceptual gap between the way our programs are written and the way they run. Because when you reason about any line of code, when you think about the values of any of the, the variables and objects, to reason about mutable values, you have to consider all of the code, or at least all of the code that that can touch. Whereas immutable values, because they can never change, you can apply that local reasoning. So the conceptual gap between your static program as it's written and how it actually runs is as small as possible. It, this applies. Great, but we were talking about encapsulation. How does that relate? Let's look at our first code example. <laughs> Very simple one. Um, we're not really going to get into code too much. But um, I thought this would work better as a code example. So imagine you have a really simple date class. So, okay, we've got a year, month and day. Model of them as integers. I'm not claiming this is the best implementation of date. That's not the point. Hopefully it's simple enough that we can illustrate what I do want to talk about, which is encapsulation. Okay, so we capture year, month, and date in the constructor. Um, we don't just store those values, though. We actually can do some checking on them. Now, that, there's a whole other topic here of where you do uh, bounds checking and input validation. So here I'm using asserts because I'm going to assume that it's a logic error to construct an invalid date. But it will at least tell you in, in debug mode if you get it wrong. If you want to do input validation, you may throw an exception. That's not the point of this talk. I've done other talks on that. What I really want to get at is that once you have constructed it, it should now be a valid date if you filtered out invalid inputs. Once it is a valid date, you would hope it would remain one. But how do we enforce that? Well, this is where one of the ways that encapsulation comes in. We make those members private and we only act uh, give access to them through accesses, the, the year, month, and day methods you see at the bottom. So far, so good. We're familiar with this. I'm, I'm sure we, we use this pattern. Um, there has been an overuse in the past of uh, setters as well as getters, basically throwing away most of what we, we get from that encapsulation. That's getting better. So let's assume we just had the getters here. Okay, now we can more or less guarantee that once you have a valid date, it will stay a valid date. Why? Because we can't change it. But if we can't change it, then why do we make those values non-const in the first place? So, oh, should have been highlighting that. There we go. If we made those members public, then obviously we could change them. But we make them const. Well, our invariant is maintained. So why would we need the getters? We could just make them public. 
Um, bit of a typo there. I should have removed the, the prefixes as well. But that aside, in many cases, not all of them by any means, but in many cases, this is just a much simpler way of doing things. Very often, again, not all the time, but very often, the classes that we write that just hold data like this are just going to be much better off just exposing that data. The data is the first class part. Often the, the reason that we do wrap them up in encapsulated um, interfaces is so that we can protect invariants that are only there if we allow mutability. It's an interesting thought. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with that one. I'm not going to say too much more about it. There is uh, another aspect to this that obviously encapsulation is a good thing. Um, may not always be as necessary as you think in all of the cases that you think, but it's definitely useful. Some languages have taken the approach of giving you encapsulation at the module level. Module is another overloaded term. Think of it in our terms as being the translation unit. So you might write a CPP file and you might say everything in this CPP file is private as far as the outside world is concerned. But within the CPP file, I can freely call any other part of it or access any other part of it. And obviously that gets complicated with header files and so on. And maybe with actual modules, that might be a better way to express that same thought. Makes a lot of sense in a way. It's actually the locality of the code that also expresses its accessibility. I think there's something in that. Maybe that's where the lines of encapsulation should be drawn. But as I say, it is a useful concept. This idea of um, immutability, simplifying things. I've talked about it at uh, much more length in another talk I've done. Functional C++ for fun and profit. Again, it'd be in the, uh, the references. Um, and a particular part of that talk I'm just going to mention briefly was talking about strings. In fact, I called it a fast and safe ref counted string. And it was relating an experience from a, a previous job where I, I wrote such a thing. And the, the way I did it was to separate the immutable string, which could be ref counted, from a separate type, which I called string builder, which actually um, encapsulates, to use that word, the, the mutability. Clearly, there are cases when you want to be able to mutate strings, particularly constructing them in the first place, if they need to be built up out of parts, um, and maybe even modified later. But for most of your program, um, strings are not expected to change. But if they are immutable, as stood string is, you pay the cost of that. So our attempts to make it reference counted to the past have hit problems because of that, exactly because of that mutability. If you use this approach of separating those out into different types, what actually happens, as this slide shows, is you get to very clearly control the lifetimes, not just of the string overall, but of the mutable and immutable parts of it. You can clearly see in the code I've got a string builder here. This is the mutable part. However, here I've just got a string. It's immutable. I can reason about it. So that reasonability comes from knowing what the invariants are of your types. If we use that, that is one of our biggest tools for closing that conceptual gap between the, the, the static code as written and read and its dynamic nature running as a process. I think that's, that's really valuable. Now, the reason I bring this up in particular with strings is because we often treat strings, or like to treat, treat, treat strings as value types. In C++, and in fact, many languages, they're not value types, or at least they maintain their own memory and may or may not have reference semantics, but they have extra complexities and that mutability is a big part of it can't be a value type if you can mutate a part of a string. If it's an immutable string, I think it's fair to call it a value type. But we can take this line of reasoning much further. As uh, Juan Pei did in his talk, uh, again, C++ on C, 
um, this year. Square in a circle, value oriented design and object oriented system. Talking about some of these same concepts, but particularly with that focus on, on value types. Uh, again, I'm only touching on this now, but I think it's really important, which is why I want to point you with that talk. Uh, I think value types are really uh, important tool for simplifying our code and minimizing that conceptual gap again. But I want to get to my closing uh, thoughts before we wrap up. Try to bring this all around. Can we actually have the best of, of both worlds? Of all the good things, all the good parts of OO, but also all of the uh, the other things, the um, the value types, the immutability, uh, type erasure, all those other things we looked at. Can we have the best of all worlds? So my talk title was OO considered harmful. Now we said that that was a, a snow clone, a bit of a meme. Generally, it doesn't really mean it's completely evil. It means there are some good parts and there's some bad parts and maybe we um, we get them all as a bundle we want to be able to look a bit more critically so i think that's what we're trying to do there are definitely some good parts to oo we want to throw those out the way i look at it is tend to split it between low level and high level at a low level in the small i usually prefer immutable value types like that string class I just talked about. And many other topics we haven't had time to talk about today. I've talked about some of my other talks um, and others talk about them as well, of course. Persistent data structures, another functional concept to allow us to uh, share um, common state amongst otherwise immutable types. Magnetic, magnetic operations. You don't necessarily have to understand what they are, but being familiar with the operations themselves will actually allow us to get a lot of the benefits that we get from OO in a more functional, immutable world, particularly uh, chaining sequences of, of functions. Builders, like the, the string builder, there's a more general pattern of being able to separate like a construction phase from an immutable usage phase and often even going back into a, a construction phase again when you need to particularly with um, uh, movable types. That can be uh, quite an efficient way to do things. And of course, functionally composable algorithms like ranges that we're getting C++ 20. All these things tied together, and they definitely have a very functional feel to them. That's how I prefer to work at the low level because these are the tools that I feel give me the, the best chance of closing that conceptual gap between how the code is written and how it actually runs. But at the high level, I think this is definitely where the, the OO concepts really shine, particularly encapsulation. Again, maybe at a larger, uh, le a higher level than, than we're often used to using it. Um, maybe even going as far as what we might call active objects, actors, or coroutines. They're all slightly different variations of the same thing, really. Things that act not only encapsulate state, but encapsulate runtime as well. If we had these sort of larger components uh, with their own mutable state built out of essentially immutable low-level components, I found that to be the best recipe for code that you can understand, but is also still useful. That's my best of all worlds. And with that, I'm going to go and have a look to see if there's some questions. Um, while I do that, I'm going to leave that slide up because it has that link to my website where all the references I've talked about are. So levelofindirection.com. You can also get to it from extralevelofindirection.com, just redirects there, uh, slash refs slash oo-harmful.html. I'll try and remember to paste that in the uh, in the chat um, afterwards. Let's go and have a look at questions. So what do you think of the pimpolidium for encapsulation? That's a really interesting question because 
the pimpalidium actually um, gives you better encapsulation than just the, uh, the private or protected keyword itself. Because private or protected is about um, access. Whereas true encapsulation would also be about visibility. And if everything is in your uh, class declaration, then you can see it there and your, your code can even depend on it indirectly. If you move it out of the uh, accessible header file using the pimpalidium, then you actually get better encapsulation as a result. So where you need encapsulation, that can be a good way to go. Now, of course, the theory is modules should give us all of those same benefits uh, in a nicer package. Um, still remains to be seen how true that's going to be, but I'm, I'm still hopeful. So I, I still think that the module is going to be the better unit of encapsulation, but the Pimpalidium may be a good stepping stone. Um, yeah, one thing I didn't mention actually was one of the problems with encapsulation in C++ is if you have a, a class with private implementation, which has a reference to another instance of the same class, it can actually see uh, inside that class. You can see it's private members, can access the private members. Whereas uh, the Pimpalidium, we, we, you can still do it, but you'd have to go an extra level of indirection. Uh, what do you think of Go's approach to polymorphism? Uh, that would be a really interesting question. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar enough with Go to uh, to know exactly what the differences are. So I'm going to have to um, talk to you afterwards about that one, Victor. Uh, Pimpalidium was originally called the Cheshire Cat Idiom by John Carolan sometime in the mid-1980s. Um, thanks, Jonathan. I think that's what we call more of a comment than a question. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't know the Pimpalidium, by the way, and you're watching this talk, you should probably look it up. It's, uh, hopefully you shouldn't need to use it too much these days, but it's really something you need to know. 